Okay. Trying to get to the reason we're all here today. Tim Cummings is our speaker. Tim is a close friend of mine. We've known each other for about five years for sure. Tim is a great member of our His wife Jackie, his wife Jackie, who's back there standing, Jackie. Jackie's a teacher of Holy Trinity. Tim is very active in the sales business, and he's also very active here in the parish. He's written two books now. And I won't spend a lot of time talking about it, but let's just do a big hand for our speaker, Jim Cummings. Thanks, Bobby. Hey, I uh, just want to let, let you know that I want to thank Bob for letting me. I squished 10 hours of a presentation down to five. So, so get comfortable. Thanks, Bob. Give me a second here to set up. I want to, I'm going to point out uh, several people in the audience, so I apologize ahead of time that I'm going to pick on a few people here and there. But uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Stroud for coming tonight. He's a great urologist, and if you need a urologist at your age with BPH and all those things, Bob's the man to talk to. So he's a parishioner, and I appreciate him coming. I want to thank my Chirp 13 guys for coming. Round of applause for Chirp 13. And uh, <clears throat> I know I'll talk about it eventually, but Jeff Epp was my table leader in Chirp 5. He, uh, he had a, a major impact on, on my spirituality, and I want to thank Jeff for coming tonight. Um, again, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Men's Club. Thanks, and the barbecue is amazing. The sauce, of course, is, a, is awesome. We look forward to seeing that in the store. So uh, this is a picture of my hero right here. So this is the Virgin Mary. I want to thank my wife too, by the way, for coming tonight. That's kind of embarrassing that she's here, but uh, it's a men's club meeting, you know. <clears throat> so besides my wife, uh, the Virgin Mary is truly my hero, and she's the she's the one that brought me back to the church. <clears throat> I was uh, born Catholic, but uh, fell away, and I hope to give you a little little idea of my background here. Before I start, I always like to start with a prayer. So if you'll uh, Help me out with this. We'll go through and do the memorari uh, for our Virgin Mother. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come. Before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful, O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so a little background on me. I, uh, I was raised in a large family of ten. I'm the eighth child of ten. And, you know, when you're young, you think uh, the whole world revolved around our family and our kitchen, of course, everything that we had uh, was on a double burner, right? I didn't know that they made single skillets. I thought everything came in doubles. That's how sheltered I was. Of course, then I went off to Holy Trinity grade school. So again, I was sheltered, living in the bubble, all Catholic, right? Get out in the real world, find out, well, wait a minute, Catholics are a major minority, okay? So at the age of 18-ish, I, uh, I started kind of sneaking out of church. I'm not proud of it, but it's just what I did. <clears throat> and I found out that I didn't burst into flames. Like, uh, you know, I thought, boy, if I miss mass, something tragic is going to happen. Nothing happened. So I went, well, heck, that was easy. Now I don't have to go back at all. So I worked it into my schedule, right? Show up, get a bulletin, walk out, hit the you know, time clock, and walk off. So um, not proud of that, but... Uh, Anyhow, so I didn't really think about Lucifer being a real person that was playing a role in salvation and that, that I was being tricked. I was being tricked uh, in so many ways that um, I'm really not proud of it. But again, I, I keep thinking maybe something like St. Augustine as a role model might give me the inspiration to do what it takes to become a saint. So after Chirp 5 that I mentioned, I, <clears throat> something happened in Chirp to me. Something physically happened. Jeff was at our table. A couple people noticed. I said, boy, have you, are you guys noticing something around? Maybe it was just me. But it was like my wife, right? She 
So I said, is it hot in here or just me? Well, no, it's probably just you. Well, it was just me at that moment. So I decided that everything that I needed to learn was about Christ and Mary. I needed to learn and gather all the information I could. I listened to Catholic radio every day. I've read books one after another. I got on YouTube. I, I, I circumnavigated the globe with, with uh, Google and just looked up everything. The pros and the cons of the faith looked into every aspect trying to figure out where the real truth was. Is there any truth? Was the Catholic Church the true church or not? <clears throat> and then, of course, Mary got a hold of me, the Virgin Mary, and uh, changed my life altogether. So, with that, I, I talk... <laughs> Talk about being caught between a rock and a hard place. After Chirp 5, I was with Rick Self, Bob Allenfeld, Dan Feeney, Kyle Eberlein, Ralph the Prayer Warrior. I had no choice. I was taking a whole different path than when I came in to Chirp. <clears throat> and, and I said, Rick, what the heck? These stats are kind of alarming. This is our Catholic faith, right? 7% are active in ministries. Now, our church may be a little different, we're probably in the 10 to 12 percent range. I don't know if anybody's done any stats on it, maybe a little higher. We're probably above average, right? If it's 10 or 12, is that good? Or would you like to see it? 50 percent? 75 percent? We might be able to change that, right? Amen? Yeah, okay. That's Father Dave Pavanka, by the way. Amen. Yeah, if he doesn't get one back, he's going to throw it back at you. So, <clears throat> 40, less than 40% believe in the true presence in the Eucharist. Less than 40%. It's like 37%. I don't know what happened to the Catholic faith. We've all been just sitting around getting beat up, and now we've just let it all slide away from us, right? If Christ walked in that door right now, of course he's not. Well, I wish he would. If he walked in that door right now, what would you do? Would you sit on your hands? Would you get up, go greet him? Would you run to him? I think I'd run, right? If Jesus Christ walked in that door, I'd run. So, uh, hopefully, in my book and some other things, might, might spur a little interest to dig deeper, but it, I really wanted to find out about this real presence in the Eucharist, understand what it really means. And then, of course, less than 10% believe in the Marian dogmas. Now, what's a dogma, right? A dogma is what you, to be a Catholic, you have to go with all the dogmas, right? Well, my brother says, heck, I don't know. There's, there's four Marian dogmas. I'm not sure I believe in this whole virginity thing. Perpetual virginity. I can leave that one out and still be Catholic, right? I said, no. You need to figure it out. You need to understand it. You need to be able to defend it. I shouldn't say defend. You need to be able to explain it to people that are, that are not aware of all the things that are out there that God put into place, right? Just like you would want to talk about Christ on the cross. It would happen, historically speaking. Everybody knows about it. <clears throat> it's not challenged that much. Uh, and then, of course, <laughs> the five precepts of the church. These are the minimum requirements. I was way below minimum, right? Okay, what, does anybody know the five precepts? Anybody know one? Right? You got to go to church every Sunday, right? That's one. I missed that one. What's another one? Confession. How many times? How often? Community once a year. That's right. So hopefully you go to confession first and then go to community because more than likely you've been missing mass or something in there. The other two are a little bit trickier, right? You have to also follow uh, all the, the feast or the fasting days, right? So if the church says you have to fast, you do penance, do all that, you do that. And then the last but not least is supporting the church. Right? We, we have to support our church. That doesn't mean you have to financially come in and lay down some cash, because that doesn't hurt, right? But you have to do it according to your needs. Five precepts. Real simple. I was terrible. I'm trying to catch up. So, if you see me running, it's because I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to catch up, make up for lost time. And, of course, some people just say they're too busy for match. Right? What happens on Sundays? Well, I got a football game to go to, or I got kids sports, or I got, it always seems to be around sports, but it could be travel. And even travel doesn't leave you a whole bunch of uh, excuses, right? There's a mass app, you can find out where mass is anywhere in the world, tell you the times, and you can work around it. And for heaven's sakes, they made it even valid on Saturdays, right? So you can go on Saturdays, late Sundays. <clears throat> so, 
my hope was, in talking to Rick and Kyle and Bob and, and all these guys, all my two brothers, was to figure out a way to help Catholics engage in their faith. Get excited about it, right? Be Pentecostal. This is a Pentecostal church, believe it or not. We just forgot how to do it. And we're kind of embarrassed about our faith sometimes, right? So I'm the sign of the cross at meals at restaurants. Do it. It's a great way to stay in your faith and just give praise to God all the time. Of course, marrying apparitions and then the use of Eucharistic miracles, I hope to go through some of that. And of course, that's really what my book's all about. Just so you know, I, uh, I really worked hard on my second book. It's called The Virgin War. It's available too. I tried to get it out for this meeting, and luckily I got pushed back a month. So it's available. They're five bucks each. I try to make them cheap. If you don't have five bucks, just take a book. I don't really care. I'm just trying to cover my printing costs. So, as I, as I looked into the faith, right? Pedro's a good example, right? He's looked into the faith just a little bit. He's on YouTube. He's got stuff out there all over the place. He's on fire. I love it. So I, I did the same thing. I went, well, heck, I'm going to post a bunch of videos on YouTube. So if you, if you Google Jim Cummings, True Presence, Jim Cummings, Rosary Presentation, Jim Cummings, Shroud of Turin, any of those, you can pull them up and watch them. I'm really actually kind of proud of the Shroud of Turin one. How many, how many believe that the Shroud is the real, actual burial cloth of Christ? Pretty much everybody, right? Does science believe that it is? Yeah, why? It was sabotaged. And you'll find out in the video how it was sabotaged, but it's, the more you look into it, the more you understand it, <clears throat> the more you'll find out that this is a true thing. True, true, true. Not a little bit true, really true. Uh, and we, we did one, I call it the Quacks Like a Duck production to make fun of uh, Father Dave Pavanka's um, wild goose, right? So this is actually just the men of the rosary. So it's our rosary men's group on, on Saturdays. We did a little, you know, give me, your, give me a, your favorite mysteries. We have five guys doing five of their favorite mysteries. It's a short little talk. It's fun. And it's our church. Kind of neat. Uh, and of course, the Virgin Mary TC Jam. So anytime I have a chance to talk about Mary, I'm going to always put a plug in for her to totally consecrate yourself to Jesus through Mary. Okay? It's a 33-day consecration. If you haven't done it, do it. If you've done it, do it again. Just keep doing it year after year. It will change your life. Also, the five first Saturday devotion, that's a big one. Most of my Chirp 13 guys, super proud of you guys. Thank you. You've all done it. And uh, so that's that slide. I'm glad this is working, by the way. So here's, here's Jim Cummings right here, right? There's no saint without a past, no sinner without a future. St. Augustine was a bad dude. I'm pretty sure he didn't compete with me. I'm pretty competitive. Most people know I, I don't like losing, and I beat him on this one. So Steve Landon just mentioned he didn't want, he's just hoping to get into purgatory, right? I think we're all just, wow, if I can just get to purgatory, you know, heaven just seems pretty hard. Don't do it. Catherine, uh, St. Catherine, um, what's her name? Of Siena, St. Catherine of Siena. Her mother dies. Catherine of Siena was given the, big, she was given the uh, gift of reading minds. Okay, and she also knew when people were gonna go to heaven, the whole thing. So she, she was given this incredible gift. She abused it a couple of times, unfortunately, but God put her back in place. Her mother dies. Catherine, and she knows she's going to purgatory, right? She already knows from what her mother did in her life that she didn't qualify to go straight to heaven as a saint. She's going to purgatory. <clears throat> Catherine Sander threw herself over her mother's body and said, don't take her. She's not ready. That's how serious she was about not wanting her mother to have to suffer in purgatory. So God brought her back to life. She lived another 10, 15 years working directly with St. Catherine of Siena, doing her thing, made her way right into heaven. So that's just a plug for heaven, by the way, not purgatory. So, and I love this one, right? Jesus doesn't call the perfect, he perfects the calls, called, and, uh, and of course, Really, my second book is really more about Satan and Mary, the battle between the two, the hierarchy that, that Christ or God created with mankind in there with spirit and matter. But uh, 
you know, de the devil or the deceiver or Satan or Lucifer, there's a million names for him. He's out there. They're out there, right? If a third of the stars in the sky came to earth and are running the show here, they're in charge of this planet, right? They're in charge of this planet. Not us. They are. We can ask Mary for her help, ask Mary for her protection in the memorari. You are asking her to put her cloak around you and protect you from the bad guys. So do what you can. Pray to Mary. Ask for her help. She will definitely do her thing to help you. <clears throat> so within this book, I thought, well, heck, what happened to the church? We've all fallen asleep. We've given up on, on the Eucharist. We've given up on Mary. We've given up on so many things that we need to be excited about. This is it. This is a Catholic church. The church that Jesus Christ started, for heaven's sakes, Right? And now we're just letting it fall apart. I mean, not us, because you guys are obviously active members here. But as Catholics in general, the way I was, I was letting it fall apart. <clears throat> so what's happening, right? Satan wants a few things gone. He wants the magisterium gone. He wants the Pope. He doesn't want you to follow the Pope. He wants to dismantle the whole thing. Dismantle the sacred tradition. Jesus is God and man. You know, we, we fought all these battles, right, in the third and fourth centuries. But... They're still out there. They're still happening. They still resurrect themselves. We, if we eliminate priests, what do we get rid of? We get rid of the Eucharist, right? We can't let that happen. We have to do what we can to bring new people into the seminary. This is a big deal. They're starting to flood back in. We lost them, right? Priest scandal really, really hurt the church. It was a self-inflicted wound. We did it to ourselves, but we're making a change in that. So do what you can to help that. Um, and of course, multiple sects, you know, it just seems like everybody reinterprets. The most, most misinterpreted, most powerful book in the world is the Bible. And yet, everybody reads it and says, well, I think it means this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And so now we have, what, 30, 40,000 Protestant denominations out there? And I like to quote, <clears throat> Mike Maguziak made a comment <clears throat> one time, and he says, you know, I think Jesus is is actually crying right now. You know, maybe that's not the right word. What did you say? He's weeping because of all the things that are changing, people not really following his way, what he asks us to do. These aren't rules and regulations. These are just the things you do to get to heaven. And of course, invisible church. I don't know if not many people really follow that, but St. Francis de Sales, who was very influential in my first... <laughs> I plagiarize a lot, by the way. So anything that I see, I put it in my book. I read a lot from Scott Hahn. It's in my book. Sorry. David Anders. Sorry, it's in the book. So, so Invisible Church really came from St. Francis de Sales. So he, he, was, he, was, um, he was born basically around the uh, time of the Reformation. He was an attorney. He was brilliant. <clears throat> he became a priest. And his father was very angry. He was almost killed a million times over the whole thing. Made a big change in Geneva with um, the Calvin faith. This, the, the diocese he was given had seven Catholics and 70,000, um, I just said it, sorry, Calvin. Protestant Calvin, right. He flipped it. Seven Calvins after he was done, the rest were Catholic. Pretty big deal. But their big thing was, oh, it's an invisible church. It's just, you can have church anywhere, anytime. It's just all over the place. Knowing full well that we have a visible church that's sitting right there, has a real altar, which is a connection straight to heaven, has priests and the Eucharist, the whole thing with all the sacraments, right? It's a visible church. When you hear invisible, you know you're being tricked, okay? So this, uh, I'm putting a plug in for, we hope, St. Emil Capon, and I think Bob and some others are trying to put a trip together to go visit his little hometown in Kansas. But this is an actual uh, recording just before he passed away. This is something he said. I'm going to read it. He says, we could surely expect that in our own lives there will come a time when we must make a choice between being loyal to the true faith or of giving allegiance to something else which is opposed to or an alliance with our faith. God, we ask of thee to give us the courage to be ever faithful to thee. That's Emil Capon. Gave his life protecting soldiers, bringing a mass during uh, battles. And he really, he just gave up his life to protect these men. It's an incredible story. And 
there's been a few miracles we hope that are associated with him. Maybe we can figure out a way to make him saint. But um, if you pray to him, more than likely he'll help you too. If you use his name, let the Vatican know so we can get sainthood going. <laughs> so with the four Marian dogmas, you know, it's funny, the dogmas of the church, a lot of these were through sacred tradition were just part of what everybody just took for granted. Oh, well, well of course, Mary is the mother of God. Yeah, and oh yeah, perpetual virginity, immaculate conception, all that was taken for granted until somebody or someone challenged it, right? And when they challenged it, they made a statement and said, well, I'm sorry, I'm cutting off the bottom there, but the Council of Ephesus, right? People were just like, whoa, 431, yay, Mary is now the mother of God because the church has put their stamp of approval on it. It was already a stamp of approval, but now we had to put, now it's time stamped. Big deal, right? It was already there. But some people use this against us and say, well, you just invented that in 431. Like, no, we didn't invent the Immaculate Conception either. That was, we just knew that was real until it was challenged. So I'm trying to figure out these things. That t probably for most people, the toughest one is the perpetual virginity. And maybe I could do another talk another time about that. So, a little disclaimer. So in the book, right, I found myself really chasing private devotions. These are Marian apparitions, Guadalupe, Fatima, Lourdes, Medjugorje, Cavijo, the real ones, right? The ones that the church has actually put their stamp of approval, with the exception of Medjugorje. <clears throat> and these are not something that you are required to believe as a Catholic. The dogmas are private devotion, no, because it happened after Christ's death. And I think that maybe the Protestants had something to do with this. They're like, hey, guys, you can't just keep reinventing this religion of yours because every day something new happens, right? St. Dominic, all of a sudden Mary visits him and says, hey, here's a rosary, pray it. This is a weapon that's awesome, right? Well, that's a private devotion. You don't have to pray the rosary. You don't even have to believe it came from Mary. But we all pray the rosary, right? So, so the public and private, just so you know, there's, and I, and I try to give an idea in the book of kind of making that line of demarcation so that you don't go talking to people and go, well, this is the Catholic Church, you know, belief. What well, is, if it's been proven by the church to be, to have all the functionality of a true miracle, right? It has to go beyond science, it has to go beyond our natural laws of science. And if it does, and it, they stamp all the things they have to stamp, they go, oh, Guadalupe happened. Okay, Fatima happened, good. So with that said, let's move right into, I don't, I'm not gonna tell you about these stories, I'm just gonna take, walk you through them though. And just, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to laugh because most of this stuff is, is laughable. How much information is in the shroud of the shroud that uh, Juan Diego had on his back or front, right? Develops in front of Bishop Zaraga in Mexico in 1531, just develops like a Polaroid camera right in front of him. So, do you see this in the history books? You know where our history books come from? They're not written by the Catholic Church. They're written by another faith. So you won't see this in history books. What's significant about it? Well, let's see. The stars on her cloak happened to align with the star constellations the day she appeared. Well, what are the odds of that happening? I'd say it's pretty small, right? And oh, by the way, the Aztecs knew stars. And they're like, oh my gosh. They looked right at her cloak and said, oh, something happened in here. They know the sash. Does this have a pointer on it, Bob? They, this sash right here says that she's pregnant with child, right? And the star constellation over her belly is Leo and Virgo, the virgin over her heart. And oh, by the way, the crown of, she's crowned, right, as queen of heaven. The corona borealis just happens to be on her head. What are the odds of that all happening? Pretty slim, right? So we just overlay that image and it fits perfectly on her cloak. The dress she's wearing is a topo map of Mexico. What are the odds of that happening? So science recently discovered that the reflection in her eyes, I'm gonna pick on Ralph here for a second. When, when Ralph takes a picture of you, right? He, you can see Ralph in the reflection of your eyes. If you zoomed in close enough, you can see Ralph saying, just one more. 
right? That's Ralph, right? One more. It's never was just one, always two. So the picture in her eyes, these people in her eyes, because of the, the difference in the, the distance of the eyes apart, show different people in the room. The moment she appeared on the cloak, the tilma, is a snapshot of the people in the room, the Pope, the interpreter, Juan Diego, a family. It's all written on her eyes if you magnify it enough. Pretty amazing, right? Then you move into France, Lourdes. And this is the best part, right? This is where Mary appears to a little girl, Bernadette, a little young girl. It's always a little kid because they're so humble, right? Right, kids? Aren't you guys humble? Yeah, Mary loves you guys at your age. Just, yeah, wait, that's right. She loves you. So if she ever visits you, I want to know because I'm bringing my Polaroid camera. So when she appears, right, she didn't tell. I mean, Bernadette wants to know who she is. They're just praying the rosary over and over and over again. Finally, the last visit, she says, I'm the Immaculate Conception. Well, the church made it dogmatic four years prior, right? So what are the odds of that happening here? She, she didn't say, I'm the Virgin Mary. I'm the Immaculate Conception. Oh, yay. Oh, and by the way, uh, Bernadette's body is incorruptible, right? So 40 years, she was exhumed a couple times. They, they wanted to take her heart out and just check out, see how good her heart was. They said, no, nah, don't take the heart. But she can play with the liver. Her liver, after 40, 50, 60 years, it was still soft and supple like she had just passed away. It still had, it was, I mean, it should have turned to dust. And Dr. Straddle let us know that livers don't normally last that long, so... <clears throat> then we fast forward to Fatima. We just celebrated the 100 year anniversary, right? This is a big deal. Three children, again, a year before Mary shows up, the, the uh, angel Gabriel says, hey, be prepared. Something big's gonna happen. Has them pray, do some things. Well, 70,000 people witnessed the miracle of the sun. It's written up in Life Magazine. Newspapers all over the globe. Do you hear about it anywhere? Do you see it in any history books? Zero. Zip, zilt. Our church is being squished. And these are the things they don't want you to put your hands or arms around. Even though it's a private devotion, I love it. I think it just kind of keeps adding on to what we already know about Mary. Right? Mary was created above all things. Above all things. What does that mean? Above the angels. What does that mean? Lucifer was an angel. She was created above him. I don't know what this slide is, but it sure is dark. Okay, so she is the parallel, if you read the Bible with typology, where you look at the Old and the New Testament, look at what's foretold and what's, what's revealed, there's a perfect parallel of the Ark of the Covenant in front of David. Right? All the things that happened in the ark happened exactly the same with Mary, and a beautiful correlation of what the Ten Commandments carved and the manna, the whole thing. So I know you can read, it's in the book. But so Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. You gotta point this out to people. They don't see this sometimes, it's not very obvious. All right, so glad my slide's getting cut off. All right, I need someone that's a baseball player. Or ever played baseball in the room? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tony. Let's give Tony a round of applause here. So Tony is left-handed. His shoulder is broken. He can't even lift his arm, but he's going to help, help me with a little thing here. So I call this the fastball bread of life, even though the bottom's cut off. So come on over here, Tony. Come on a little closer. So I'm just going to have Tony. He's going to go right-handed, so he's going to look like he's throwing like a... Girl, yeah, but I, we're going to play a little game here. So, all right, why don't you stand right here? All right, how how many feet is the uh, the pitcher's mound away from home plate? Sixty feet, six inches. Sixty feet, six inches, and a ninety-five mile an hour pitch takes how long before the batter has a chance to hit it? Half a second. Half a second. Point, point, point four one seven seconds at ninety-five miles an hour. You guys watch the World Series, right? Some of these guys were throwing some heat. They throw 95, you're just like, there is no time to look at it and go, yeah, I think I'm going to swing, right? You got a quarter second on both ends. Quarter second to look, quarter second to swing, and I'll be done. So how many people here have ever played baseball in their lives? Everybody, right? Everybody, right? 
softball, doesn't matter. Could be with a plastic bat, I don't care. How many could hit a home run if somebody pitched to you, not maybe today when you were younger, if I threw a 30 mile an hour pitch? One, two, that's it. I need everybody to raise their hands, come on. Amen, 30 mile an hour pitch, I can do it. How about a 95 mile an hour pitch? Those hands are really going down, right? He might have, he probably has, right? Big difference. So, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you a couple pitches here, give you an idea how much speed we're talking about. Now the fastest pitch, and of course Tony told me the real truth, but I'm gonna round it up to 105 miles an hour in a professional game, okay? That's a fast pitch, right? So now we're looking at maybe a quarter second for all of it to happen. You better be swinging early and you better hope that it's in the sweet spot. So, so Tony's gonna give me a, a right-handed throw, 30 miles an hour that we can all hit through the stadium, right? All right I want you to put it right here in, the, in my catcher's mitt. Here we go, 30 miles an hour. Watch the ball, watch the ball, watch the ball. Boom, okay, there we go, 30 miles an hour. All right, Tony, that was good. All right, step it up. We're gonna do, let's do 50 miles an hour. 50, here we go, 50, 50, 50, boom, boom, boom. Okay, nice. How about, let's go 80. 80 mile an hour pitch, ready? Watch kids, here we go, 80 mile an hour pitch. Coming a little faster, boom, a lot faster. Let's go with the 95 mile an hour pitch. Here we go, we're stepping it up. Broken arm and all, here we go. Okay, that was 95. Watch his arm, now he's gonna throw 105 miles an hour. Ready, 105, here we go, here we go, right? I mean, it was in there, right? Thanks, Tony. Round of applause for Tony, that was awesome. He's very reluctant to come up here, by the way. <clears throat> and we need to pray over him for, uh, for that. Um, so the reason I did that is really just to kind of relate where the apostles were and really kind of the transition through sacred scripture, right? So here we have, here we have Capernaum, year 32. I'm, Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Jesus died on year 33. So a year before Capernaum, Jesus is doing some crazy stuff, right? He's walking on water. He's feeding the loaves and fishes to thousands of people. They estimate around 20,000 people. If 5,000 men showed up, as women and kids showed up, that's a lot of people to feed, right? So here they said, Jesus, what do we have? Oh, by the way, that was kind of the first communion, right? Broke up in groups of 12. They're breaking bread, giving it to everybody, fed everybody. And they still had leftovers, right? Crazy. Probably ended up with more than they started with. So Jesus tells them at that point, he goes, you know, to have eternal life, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Right? So the disciples, 20,000, 30,000, we don't know. There was a ton of them. They're like, what? Did he just say we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood? No, no, no. He couldn't have said that. It's not possible. He says it again, right? No, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're like, okay, I think I heard it the second time. I don't like what I heard. So then he ups the ante. What does he do? He says, trogo, right? He says, you have to gnaw on my flesh. Gnaw on it. I mean, I want you to get into it and eat it to have eternal life. You have to eat my flesh, drink my blood. They all left, right? All but the 12, right? So the apostles are like, whoa, that was a 105 mile an hour fast pitch. We don't get it. And he says, are you guys going to leave me too? And they said, well, no, because you have the words of eternal life. Did they understand it though? No. Did they, were they going through the motions and seeing it all happen? Yeah, but they didn't get it. It went by too fast. Here. So this is 97 mile an hour pitch last supper, right? He says, you, this, what does he say? Take this and eat it, for this is, for this is, for this is my body and blood. He doesn't say it's, it's a representation of it. He said this is. And the crazy thing is, 60 years after the Reformation happened in Germany, there's a book published that has over 200 recipes for what that bread of life discourse means. That it was just 200 different representations of, oh, we, he was just kidding. He didn't really mean it. It's something else. So, 
97, 95 mile an hour fast pitch, going pretty good, right? All right, so we go, Jesus dies on the cross, resurrected, walking with two guys, right? The road to Emmaus. These guys don't know who Jesus is. They're saying, you don't know the story of Jesus? He just died on the cross. It's the biggest news that's happened. And you don't know about it? Oh, by the way, why don't you come eat, eat dinner with us, right? So what does he do? Has dinner, breaks bread, says the blessing. They're like, oh, what the heck? That's Jesus. What? Now the pitch has slowed down to 95, 7 miles an hour. So the professionals can hit it. The apostles should have gotten it. They're like, whoa, wow, that was crazy. Because we kind of heard it at Capernaum a year ago, right? Pretty good, right? Now we can go to the road to Emmaus, as I already told you. Now this pitch has slowed down to 80. Now it's hittable. The guys are like, whoa, okay, that's Jesus resurrected. He said he'd do all these things. Rebuild the church in three days. Crazy. Now they're starting to get this whole bread of life thing, right? It's starting to kick in. But I like to step forward a little bit further. Year 700, right? Priest is saying mass. And he raises the Eucharist, has a moment of doubt. Of course, Jesus, God, knows what's in our minds. He has a moment of doubt. because I don't know if it really happens. What happens? He pulls it down. It's turned into human flesh. In 1971, they said... Dr. Linoli, you have permission to examine this and tell us what it is. He says, well, it's pretty amazing. It's human heart tissue. Matter of fact, it's heart tissue from the left ventricle, which supplies blood to the whole body. Wow. For me, that pitch just slowed down to about 60 miles an hour. Very hittable, right? Everybody starting to get it now. It's like, okay, I was a slow learner. I know I skipped mass and all that stuff, but this is a real deal. Skip forward, right? 1263, another priest is saying, man, same thing. He just says, I have this moment of doubt. I don't know. I don't know. And it starts to bleed down his arm onto the altar cloth, which is what we have right here. So this is an altar cloth that's still intact today. Blood type AD just happens to match exactly what the shroud has. Coincidence? I think not, right? It's amazing. All the things that we have from Jesus, his blood match the Shroud of Turin, all the different things that touch Jesus, we have records of it, okay? This pitch is now at, what, 40 miles an hour? Everybody's starting to get their bat swinging now, because I can hit those, right? Fast forward to 1996. We were all alive in 1996. Did this make the front headline newspaper? Was it on the, is it in our history books? Do we hear about it every day? This host was found defiled in a church in Buenos Aires, taken to the priest. He put it in water to dissolve it because they were going to just let it go down the consecrated sink. Goes back three days later and it's got blood on it. Pope, Pope at the time, the bishop at the time was Pope uh, Bergoglio or Bishop Bergoglio, who is now our Pope. He said, put it in water for three years and lock it away and don't tell anybody. They pull it out, take it to a pathologist, Dr. Zugib and the game at Capernaum, he said, you have to eat it, you have to dig into it, bite it, chew it, get into my body and blood. Now, we have living white blood cells. The doctor looked at it and he says, oh, well, I can tell you, this is not only, you know, left ventricle. This is, it, it had living white blood cells. This person died from a traumatic injury, was beaten severely, and died three days ago. Of course, the guys in the room are going, three days ago, that's, that's the resurrection story. How's that even possible? The pitch is now at 30 miles an hour, guys. Right? Are we running to Christ? If you walked in the door, would you run to Him? Or come out with a mask? We've got to humble ourselves, become like children. Thank you, Pedro, for bringing your children. They're the most awesome thing around, right? Because they still have that little connection to heaven, which is great. I've lost mine a long time ago. I'm trying to get my... ...connected, reconnected. So, so we run home to Christ, right? We round first, second, third. We hit a home run. We come right home to Christ. So that's kind of my book in a nutshell. I, uh, I know I, we see signs all over the place that says, I'm number two, I'm number two. Well, I thought, you know what? I'm not number two. I'm... I'm number four. Got to put God first. How many times do we do that? We always put ourselves first. And maybe our wives, second, kids. God's in there somewhere. 
And if you do a pie chart, I did a pie chart the other day to figure out how much time I spent on God. I went, oh my gosh, it's just a sliver. It's a tiny sliver. God's number one? Hmm, maybe not. Maybe I need to flip that over. So anyway, I've really worked hard for a second book. It's called The Virgin War. And it's really about Mary and the battle with Satan and our battle with Satan. And uh, that's the book cover. There are five bucks. If you don't have any money, literally just take one, give it to a friend. You never know what could change someone's life. And because I'm no longer, I'm still kind of a proud person. I'm, I'm working on that. I admit it. So with that in mind, I don't know how many people have 9, 10 stickers on their cars. You drive a fancy Porsche, or you, you got a Mercedes Benz or something, put it on there. You know, just bring yourself down a notch. I did. I, I got three of them on my car. I may just cover the whole car with them. This radio station is very powerful. Every time I had a question, I turn it on, the answer was right there. Right there for my question, like they were reading my mind. Incredible. So I'm going to end it with my mother. Virgin Mary, my drinking cup, and um, I'll just read what, it, what I get to read every morning. It says, she says, let not your heart be disturbed. Do not fear sickness nor any other anguish. Am I not here? Who am your mother? Are you not under my protection? Am I not your health? Are you not happy, happily within my fold? What else do you wish? Do not grieve nor be disturbed by anything. I'm Jim. Thank you guys for letting me come out. <clears throat> it's turned off. Collecting all this information, collecting, collecting, collecting. And finally, I started these little YouTube videos and different things, and, and I said, I have too much information here. I have to formulate it and put it in some format that someone might actually want to read and maybe use this reference material. So that's kind of the whole thing. And now the second one, I don't know what happened. And I frankly, I don't even know what's in it. It's, uh, it's done. <laughs> but anyway, so that's that. Great question. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, how long did it take to write? Maybe um, forever, seemed like. Because once I decided to do it, um, maybe a year, year and a half, and then I had to learn how to self-publish because there's a lot to learn. I mean, it, I couldn't become a doctor and just go, you know, I think I'm going to watch an online course on how to do a TERP. But <laughs> anyway, so yeah, about a year, year and a half. Second book, maybe a little quicker just because I knew the whole publishing side a little bit better. And I'd be more than happy to help you guys with that if you, if you want some direction on it, too. Anyone? Roger. How'd you get to skip a mass on Sundays to church? Skip a mass on Sundays to here, doing this? That's, a, that's an awesome question. And um, something, uh, Father Dave Pavanka, we just watched a video from him yesterday. And everybody that's been baptized, right, has been baptized in water and the Spirit, right? Has everybody been baptized, right, water and the Spirit? Doesn't matter what church unless it's Mormon or something else. But all the Protestant churches, Catholic Church, baptism counts, right? It's the same Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> he also talks about being baptized by fire. And if you look at Matthew 3, read Matthew 3, and it talks about that very thing. And if you ask to be baptized by fire, small disclaimer, something's going to happen. Something big. So be prepared for your life to change or continue to just go that direction. Great question. Thank you. Did that answer it? <laughs> I want to thank um, Larry Landry in public here for putting on, we, we, our church brought CHIRP, Christ Renews His Parish, to Most Blessed Sacrament in Arlington. Of course, he was active in the one we brought to St. Mary Goretti in Arlington. But without Larry, we literally could not have done what we did. And uh, we owe him a big round of applause and gratitude for all he did with that. Of course, everything else in the church too, but that's a big one. Thanks, Bob.